this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome back for more continuing education. Today we're going to be talking about renal failure and dialysis patients, which um, make up a significant number of our emergencies. So hopefully after today's talk, you'll be more familiar with the way the kidneys work and more familiar with some of our more common dialysis problems. As you know, this is very prevalent in our society. Almost 15% of U.S. adults are estimated to have chronic kidney disease at the current time, and this is largely in part due to diabetes. Almost half of the patients with chronic renal failure are due to poorly controlled diabetes. The other almost 30% are due to high blood pressure. So between diabetes and high blood pressure, which are two theoretically modifiable, controllable risk factors, it's leading to some pretty bad kidney disease in our population. The other segment of the population who has kidney disease is usually due to genetic causes or underlying medical problems. So if we take a quick look as we do generally, we start with anatomy. So if you take a look at the kidney and you look at the inside of the kidney, the way that it works at a very basic level is blood comes in from the artery, right? This is oxygenated blood. It gets delivered to the smallest parts of the kidney, and out here where the blood gets delivered from the heart, it goes to something called the glomerulus. And this is the magic super chemistry factory in your body that does a whole lot of electrochemical gradient management to pull out the good things that your body needs and to turn the bad things that your body doesn't need into waste. And so as blood comes from the heart, goes through the glomerulus, gets filtered using some super fancy chemistry, the good stuff comes back to the heart through the renal vein, right, which will probably go to the lungs first. And then the stuff that the body doesn't need is filtered out through the urine and into the urine collecting system. So that's the way the kidney works at a very high level. Kidneys are one of my favorite organs, by the way. Um, but the kidney essentially is a filter. It keeps the good stuff. It kicks out the bad stuff. But things that make the filter get clogged. So high blood sugar makes it pretty thick and hard to filter if it's chronically high. And then high blood pressure makes your vessels, those tiny little vessels that are delivering blood to the glomerulus, it makes them smaller and under higher pressure, so there's less blood that's getting filtered. So as a result, there's more protein that leaks through the filter, and there's problems removing waste, and that's what leads to kidney failure. So if you look at a kidney that's sick, here we have um, a look at the cross-section of a kidney, again, where you have your artery delivering blood to these calyces here where the glomerulus lives out in the cortex of the kidney. You can see here that this is an atherosclerotic or artery that's full of plaque that has a very narrow lumen and there's not much room for blood delivery there. And so the glomerulus, when it gets out to do their filtering, there's not much blood to filter. And so that's why that's a problem. Here's the healthy looking kidney under a microscope. You can see lots of room for the the arteries and the veins, you got a nice open glomerulus here that can do a lot of filtering and exchange of ions and acid-base balance and all of those things. Well, if you look, compare that to a diseased kidney under the microscope, just the naked eye, you can see a very clear difference in the, the way that the two look. So this one is just congested, full of cells. The glomerulus is not nice and open. It looks like it's damaged. There's all kinds of scar tissue, not much room for blood flow. The kidney itself is atrophied and kind of scarred down and hard. And so that's what it looks like when someone has renal failure. So there's causes. The kidneys don't necessarily have to fail. They're a very fragile organ, so they can be injured as well. And chronic injury over time is going to lead to failure. But sometimes just small things can lead to injury. So there's three ways that kidneys can be injured, and it's divided into pre-renal, which is a problem that happens before things get to the kidney. So this is usually heart failure where the heart can't pump enough blood for the kidney to see or sepsis where there's such profound vasodilation that the kidney doesn't see enough blood flow. Blood loss obviously or very bad dehydration can all cause damage to the kidney and usually that's due to blood flow before it gets to the kidney. Then there's 
intrinsic renal problems that can cause kidney injury. So this is actually a problem with maybe the glomerulus. Maybe it's infected. Maybe there's problems with the vessels. Maybe the glomerulus is clogged due to drugs or toxins or maybe inflammation or even infection. So intrinsic renal problems can cause injury as well as problems after urine leaves the kidney. So problems with the ureteral system. So whether it's a kidney stone, if urine backs up into the kidney and causes too much pressure, it can cause kidney damage. Fibrosis, sometimes chronic urinary retention can do it, different types of cancers. So one of the first questions we ask when we have a patient with renal failure is where is the problem? Is it before the kidney? Is it in the kidney? Or is it after the kidney? And that can kind of help you troubleshoot how to help them get better. Sepsis is one of the leading causes of kidney injury that we'll see in the pre-hospital setting. This is due to an infection, and typically patients will have fever, tachycardia, hypotension. Look for end titles less than 25, and that's going to indicate that they have too much acid building up in their blood. If that's what's happening, and you suspect this is septic shock and they're not getting better with fluids, remember that initiating a presser is going to help bring up that blood pressure and deliver more blood flow to this kidney so it can do its job and filter out waste. Rhabdomyolysis is also another common pre-hospital emergency that we see, and I know you're all familiar with this after going through the, the fire academy and being very concerned about it with the muscle breakdown and the constant physical activity that goes on up there. This can be caused by crush injury, very strenuous exercise, or even immobility. So think about this in your elderly patients who've been on the floor for four days and not able to get up without any help. But essentially, muscles break down, and one of the big components of muscles is called myoglobin, and this is a very big protein that essentially is too big to get filtered through the smaller parts of the kidney, and it clogs up the glomerulus and causes a kidney injury which leads to inflammation and then dysfunction of the glomerulus and eventually cell death. And so what we do for that is we try to flush those proteins right out of the kidneys. So we give a whole lot of fluid for rhabdo, if that's what you're suspecting, to where the urine becomes clear, because typically in ra bad rhabdomyolysis, the urine will look like a tea color or a coffee color, and that's due to kidney injury. But the big thing we worry about in the pre-hospital setting is hyperkalemia. And so in these patients, I would get a 12 lead if you're suspecting rhabdo and look for these peak T waves in the anterior leads. You see how they look like big mountains there? And sometimes you'll just see it in V2 and V3. But this is um, something that I would treat in the right clinical setting. And so there are also medications that can cause renal failure. Uh, aspirin, not necessarily just a daily baby aspirin, that's usually fine for the kidneys and is actually good for arterial disease, but an overdose of aspirin will definitely cause renal failure. Same with lithium. These are the top two toxic overdoses that are going to require emergency dialysis. But one of the drugs that patients can take over the counter in recommended doses that does cause kidney injury without an overdose is ibuprofen. So we're very, very careful given ibuprofen. Don't want people taking it too much, especially our elderly population who already probably have atherosclerosis and worsening renal function at baseline. And the reason we don't want to give ibuprofen to the elderly population is because it directly affects blood flow to the glomerulus and inhibits the filtering that needs to happen. So NSAIDs decrease the blood flow in the afferent tubule. This is the artery that brings blood in for the filtering, and then the blood is sent out by the efferent, NSAIDs are going to decrease the blood flow that comes in. And so we don't want to do that too often or too frequently for our elderly folks, because chances are this is already decreased just due to the normal aging process as it is. So symptoms of renal failure, patients may complain of swelling in their feet or their legs, their skin may itch, they may notice that they actually have increased urination, feel confused, feel tired, feel short of breath. Actually, fatigue is one of the most common, and I know it's nondescript, but this is something to think about. And then sometimes if there's buildup of too many toxins in the body, it can cause nausea or vomiting. So our triggers for emergent dialysis, and this is something to keep in the back of your mind and you can actually evaluate for in the pre-hospital setting without laboratory. Acidosis, if the patient is acidotic, they may be 
a candidate for emergent dialysis, and we can tell that by their end title. If they have electrolyte abnormalities, which we can pick up on a 12 lead and notice that they have hyper K, that's another reason. If they have an overdose, namely that aspirin overdose that we talked about, or lithium, those are two ions that the kidney, if it's overloaded with those, it just can't process and can lead to death. And so if that's an overdose, we need to get that patient dialyzed as quickly as we can to help get those things out of their system. If the patient is fluid overloaded, so they're starting to get pulmonary edema and they're hypoxic, you'll be able to see that or hear that on your lung sounds and evaluate for the hypoxia when you get your vitals. And then uremia. This is a toxin that the kidneys can't filter if they're not working right, and typically this will cause confusion or fatigue. So A-E-I-O-U, acidosis, electrolytes, ingestion, overload, or uremia are all reasons to consider dialysis. Uremia, I know you may or may not have heard of it before, and it's kind of a fancy metabolic thing, but the, the bottom line is nitrogen and nitrogen products that are waste products can be toxic to the brain and to some parts of the body. So our body, the kidneys and the liver work very, very hard to process nitrogen and keep it in a safe form in the body and then get it exported outside of the body. And nitrogen comes from protein. So as we eat more protein, our body metabolizes it to more nitrogen. And a healthy body with a healthy liver and healthy kidneys can process nitrogen well and just send it out through the waste system. But if the kidneys are failing or sometimes if the liver is failing, then the nitrogenous waste products are going to build up. And with kidney failure, uremia is what happens. And so too much blood urea nitrogen can cause confusion, can cause neuropathies, it makes the skin really dry, it may lead to palpitations, muscle weakness, fatigue, chronic nausea, leg swelling, anemia, all of these things go with renal failure. And one of the big things that you'll see in your renal failure patients that have chronic renal failure is anemia, and that's because the kidneys secrete a hormone called erythropoietin, or EPO for short, and if your kidneys aren't functioning right, they're not going to secrete as much EPO as they normally do. And EPO, when it's working right, it stimulates bone marrow to make more red blood cells and keep, keep all that oxygen delivery system going. But if you're not getting the stimulating hormone from the kidney, which isn't functioning correctly, the bone marrow is not going to be stimulated and you're not going to have enough red blood cells. So these patients tend to be chronically anemic, which can lead to more worsening fatigue, sometimes shortness of breath, headache, or syncope. All the same causes and symptoms of anemia that you would expect. And this is just another way of looking at it, but not only does it affect the red blood cell lifespan, but there's also going to be iron deficiency, changes in calcium and vitamin D. There's going to be chronic oxidative stress from the anemia that's going on, and that can lead to heart failure. And so all of these things have pretty profound consequences if the kidneys aren't working right. Not only can you get heart failure, anemia, problems with your calcium, you can also get vascular disease from renal failure. So a normal functioning kidney processes a little bit of cholesterol, um, manages blood flow, filters the blood, everything's working fine. But if you get chronic kidney disease and the kidney isn't filtering as good as it usually does, you get buildup of phosphorus, you get changes in your calcium level, you get buildup of uremia, right? You can't process nitrogen anymore. And there's also problems with iron. And what that leads to is increased buildup in the lining of the arteries. And that those arteries can have buildup anywhere. So if it's in the heart, it can cause a STEMI. If it's in the brain, it can cause a stroke. If it's in the peripheral vasculature, it can cause an ischemic limb. And so just realize that these patients who have chronic renal failure and on dialysis, or even sometimes if they're not on dialysis, they have very poor vasculature at baseline and are prone to clotting and accelerated atherosclerosis. And so it's not surprising that renal failure causes increased cardiovascular mortality. Um, as patients age, of course, like after 65, it's going to approach the national average, but you can look at a at a 35-year-old with end-stage renal failure, and their risk of death is almost 10 times higher from cardiovascular disease than it is um, from someone the same age in the general population with normal functioning kidneys. So very high mortality. These are very sick patients at baseline. 
So what we can do to help them is hemodialysis, which you're all familiar with. It's basically taking the blood out of the body, and instead of using the kidney as a filter, it hooks them up to a machine that is a filter. It filters out the bad stuff just like the kidney would, puts back in the good stuff, and it comes back in through another line. And so there's different ways to pull the blood out and put it back in. One of the ways that you'll see is a tunneled catheter. This tends to be in the chest, and it goes directly into the big vessels that lead to the heart. This can Any tube that you have that leads into the skin obviously can get infected, so these, this is prone to infection. So make sure you're examining the site for the patient and looking to see if it's infected if they're sick. Another common way is the AV fistula, and this is probably the most common, where you can feel over it. Usually you'll feel a brewy or a thrill. It feels kind of kind of funny when you put your fingers over it, but if it's working, you should feel blood movement through there. These can bleed and pretty profoundly, so we'll talk about that later, and can also get infected, but these are one of the, two of the more common ways that patients can undergo dialysis. It's not uncommon during dialysis as large volumes are being taken out of the body that the patient can get hypotensive. This occurs almost half the time during dialysis because usually patients have to have almost three liters of fluid removed over four hours. And that's, if you think about it, the normal body has five liters, so that's more than half of their blood volume is going out. And no wonder they get lightheaded. So it can cause syncope. It can cause chest pain if that, if they have increased myocardial oxygen demand. It can even cause a STEMI. There is something called disequilibrium syndrome where patients may get nauseated or vomit or have really bad hypertension. And sometimes the shift can also cause uh, transient cerebral edema. So all of these things can occur during dialysis, and I know a lot of our calls are to the dialysis center when these things happen, but hopefully now you understand a little bit more about why. There's another form of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis, and this does not require any major vascular access, but it uses the fluid in the abdominal cavity and an osmolar gradient to kind of pull out the good stuff, pull out the bad stuff and put the good stuff back in. Basically how peritoneal dialysis works is there's a tube that goes into the abdominal cavity and uses the fluid. Um, the patient can put the dialysate, which is just and as molar gradient into their abdomen, and that comes from this bag here, and they let the fluid dwell in the abdomen, sometimes for a period of several hours. And what that does is it pulls the toxins out of the gastric contents and into the peritoneal cavity. And then later, all of the waste products can be drained into a drainage bag. Now with this tube, just like we talked about with the tunneled catheter, there is a risk for infection anytime a tube is going straight into the abdomen. So make sure you're asking about fever and asking about abdominal pain in these patients because they are prone to infection. Ultimately, the cure for renal failure is to get a renal transplant. Typically, when a patient gets a new kidney from a donor, it'll be placed in the right lower quadrant so it can be attached to the IVC here and real close to the bladder, it makes the attachments a little bit easier. So if you have a renal transplant patient, sometimes you can palpate the transplanted kidney in the right lower quadrant. It's very frequent. Sometimes it's rough for these patients because they're immunosuppressed, so they don't reject the kidney, but that makes them more prone to infection. So it's really important to ask them about fever, and one of the more specific signs is pain over the transplant site. So if that kidney was to get infected and they were to get a urinary tract infection, sometimes that kidney itself will get tender, so you can ask about that and if they're still making urine or not. So renal failure emergencies that we need to cover, number one, number two, and number three are all potassium. So as you know, the majority of potassium is located inside the cell in the body, and the majority of sodium is outside the cell in the body, and that gradient is what drives a lot of chemical processes in the body. But when cells burst or the body becomes acidemic or something is wrong, too much of that potassium can be released into the bloodstream, and that is very bad for the heart. And so as levels of potassium start to climb, you're going to start to see different changes on the EKG. So first you're going to start to see peaked T waves that look like big tall mountains, like an upside down V. You might see prolonging of the PR segment, but as potassium gets more and more towards lethal levels in the body, 
you're going to start to see the QRS widen out. The, P, the T waves will still stay peaked, but you're going to start to see a widening right here of the QRS, and that's when it starts to get deadly. And if it's untreated and it continues to get worse, it's going to eventually turn into a sine wave and get bradycardic. So if you have a bradycardic renal failure patient, realize that you are minutes away from having a code occur. And the reason is, is because the kidneys, like we talked about, they're chemical geniuses, and they basically regulate your acid-base function and all of your potassium and sodium stores in your body. And if your kidneys aren't working right, you have more of a tendency to build up potassium in your blood, which can be lethal. And so here we're going to look at some 12 leads of what you can expect to see in a patient who's hyperkalemic. So if you look here, we're not going to go through all of the things we look at at a 12 lead. We're just going to jump to the salient points for these. But here you can see the peak T's. Burn these in your mind. These are tall. They're like upside down V's and they're peaked. And the best place you're going to be able to see them is in your anterior and your septal leads. So namely V2 and V3. And that's where you want to look. And we'll talk about treatment in just a second. But that's what you're seeing there. Those are tall peak T waves, and that suggests to you that you have some hyperkalemia going on in the right clinical setting. Here we're getting more and more dangerous. So you have a 36-year-old, but you're starting to see um, widening of the QRS with, again, with look at these T waves. They're huge, right? Really tall, really peaked, upside down V T waves. But not only that, but the QRS is starting to widen. And not only that, but the patient's getting bradycardic. So this is a approaching critical levels of hyperkalemia, and I would very aggressively treat this patient before they code because the next step might be a sine wave, and then you would be working a cardiac arrest. And so here's another look at a hyperkalemia 12 lead. Again, you're starting to recognize the theme here, but big, tall, big peak T waves, septal and anterior leads, QRS is starting to widen a little bit. You're up to 140 here. Remember that normal QRS is less than 120. And again, getting bradycardic. And so another critically ill, possibly hyper K patient. Here we are again. Bradycardic, wide QRS, tall peak T waves. Looks like IV conduction defects as well. Again, severe hyperkalemia needs to be treated aggressively. This is a emergency you guys need to recognize and know how to treat very quickly so again here's another hyper k and you can start to see how it's looking more like a sine wave as it starts to slow down and spread out and widen over time right but again tall peak t's big wide qrs idioventricular rhythm i don't see any p waves here this is hyperkalemia burn this one into your head so what do we do about it um, oh, here's another one. Um, this one is already getting to a sine wave, right? Bradycardic, wide QRS, big T waves, looking like a sine wave. So how do we treat it? First thing we're going to do is albuterol. You want to do 15 milligrams of al nebulized albuterol. This is going to move potassium into the cell faster than anything you can give. And so if you have that bradycardic patient with a wide QRS, do your albuterol first because that is going to move potassium back into the cell where it needs to be and out of the bloodstream where it's causing trouble. You get that going, you leave it going, they have 15 milligrams, they'll be fine probably all the way to the hospital. It moves the fastest and is most effective for getting potassium where it needs to be. Now your next move, if you have a wide QRS, a QRS greater than 120, so those ones that are starting to get bradycardic and widen out, you can give calcium chloride. Realize that calcium does not move potassium. So you want to give your albuterol first because that's actually going to act on the potassium. Your calcium is just going to stabilize the heart, which is also important if you have a patient who's about to arrest on you. But realize that calcium is not your first move because it's only going to stabilize the myocardium. It's not going to move the potassium out of the way. But you can literally watch it as you push the calcium. It'll probably narrow the QRS and bring it closer together. Patients with renal failure, obviously, if they're not able to filter the blood, the fluid, extra fluid has to go somewhere if they're not making enough urine. And typically, the fluid backs up into the lungs, and that's called pulmonary edema. So here's normal lungs. Here's lungs that are full of fluid. This is what lungs full of fluid look like on a chest CT. You can see all the fluid. Here's the heart in the middle of the chest, patient's left lung, patient's right lung. 
and you can see there's solid fluid, pleural effusion, down here, this nice gray spot that's compressing the lung, and then inside the interstitium of the lung, there's fluid as well. And so if you have a hypoxic patient that sounds like there's rails and crackles everywhere in their lungs and they've missed dialysis or you think they're fluid overloaded, one of the best ways to treat that in the pre-hospital setting is to use your CPAP because that's going to give enough positive pressure to displace some of that fluid out so more oxygen and ventilation can occur. Sometimes fistulas can bleed. This is not an uncommon emergency. Just like any bleeding, you guys are experts at this. Start with direct pressure. If direct pressure doesn't work, you can pretty quickly move to a tourniquet if you need to. Just realize those are painful, and don't forget to treat pain if you end up having to place a tourniquet. As a consequence of the uremia buildup and dialysis, patients who are on dialysis, their platelets don't function normally. So normally a platelet, when it's just driving around in the bloodstream looking to form a clot, it's like this. But once it's activated, it sticks out all these sticky things so it can form a fibrin clot and start to build the basis for a scab or stop bleeding, right? But in renal failure patients who are on dialysis, they lose the ability to be activated and stay slippery. And so renal failure patients tend to bleed more easily than others because their platelets just don't work right. Another emergency that you might see is called calciphylaxis. This is a very dangerous skin condition that you might see. It's not very common, but it has a very high mortality. So look on patient's skin to see if they're developing black and necrotic areas with surrounding areas of erythema. This is due to calcification of very small vessels that leads to necrosis and really chronic wounds. And it's a very late stage injury with pretty high mortality in your, in your renal failure patients. Sometimes if they've missed dialysis or it's a new onset renal failure, you might see something called uremic frost. And it's kind of a white, frosty, not quite scaly. It doesn't look like skin, but it's almost sandy. And you can see it anywhere on the patient's skin. And this is the body's efforts to process that urea and try to get that toxin out of there when the kidneys are not able to. And it tends to crystallize on the skin. So just like any emergency, um, approach renal emergencies just like always. So address your ABCs first. If they're bleeding, obviously, you're going to do CAB. Uh, direct pressure, and then a tourniquet. Just realize that these patients are at very increased risk for vascular problems, so make sure you're getting a 12 lead for multiple reasons. One, you want to look for STEMI. Two, you want to look for hyper-K. Think about stroke. Very prone to infection, especially if they have the tunnel vas cath or they are doing peritoneal dialysis. And then ask about bleeding, because they're already anemic at baseline because of the lack of erythropoietin, and then their platelets aren't working, so make sure you ask about bleeding as well. And that is all I have. If you have any questions about this um, or anything else, I'm always happy to talk, or you can reach out to your 7-8. Thank you.